Hi everybody, this is Constantine Leufer from Loyola University Chicago, Comp 413. And um, today we're going to focus on applications with internal timers and various other aspects of um, designing such applications. So let's start with a brief sequence diagram of the click counter to tie today's discussion to the uh, previous video. And if you recall, the click counter um, was very simple in terms of responding just to user-triggered input events. In other words, the click counter would normally just sit there and it would do something only if and when the user presses a button. And we can see this on the right here, top right in the sequence diagram. So if the user presses the uh, increment button, the button increment um, event occurs. So this on increment event, that's step one. And the click counter activity receives that event through the invocation of its on increment method. And then in step 1.1, uh, the activity invokes the increment method on the stateful model, thereby incrementing the counter value. And as step 1.2, the activity invokes update view on itself, which will then in step 1.2.1 invoke the get method on the model to get that new updated value, one greater than the previous value. And still within the update view method, in step 1.2.2, um, the activity will invoke set text on the text view value uh, GUI widget so as to display the updated value back to the user. So you're seeing the entire cycle of information flow through the click counter in response to a button press. That last step, 1.2.3, is to make sure the right um, buttons are enabled or disabled, as discussed. Okay. So once again, to recap, this is a particularly simple interactive application in the sense that it won't do anything on its own, and it will only respond by some very brief sequence of action to any a user triggered event such as uh, increment button press or other button press. So today we'll look at another class of applications that have certain autonomous behavior based on internal timer events. So if we look here on the top left, um, th these are the learning objectives from the stopwatch example. And we will continue looking at modeling state-dependent behavior with state machine diagrams. And we'll continue distinguishing between view states and model states. And um, then the topics that I was just mentioning, we will drill into those a bit. So the click counter um, exemplify these user triggered input events and here we will add in the context of the stopwatch example internal events from background timers okay and the other topics are kind of to address non-functional architectural requirements and um, there are some testing topics as well so but we'll we'll focus on the um, functionality that we get through these internal timers in response to uh, certain specific requirements. So what are the requirements for the stopwatch app? Well, a good first um, place to look would be a kind of requirements narrative, but what we will want to imagine is uh, just a stopwatch that has a start-stop button and a lap-reset button, just like a 
the kind of stopwatch that is built into uh, many wristwatches as, as one of the possible modes. So suppose we have a device that has only the stopwatch mode and um, the device starts up with a um, zero time value and then with the start stop button we can start and stop um, th this process and uh, stopwatch counts time by the second and then we also have the lap reset button and if the stopwatch is running and we press the lap button then the display freezes at that lap time when we press the button and it internally continues to keep time so if we press that button again it switches back to the current running time and we can go back and forth now when the stopwatch is stopped then the lap reset button serves as the reset button so there is as part of the documentation of the stopwatch project there is a state diagram that uh, reflects these requirements I, I just uh, presented as a narrative okay and the focus is of course on the dynamic behavior that's after all the job of uh, state machine diagrams and let's walk through this so we have um, we're assuming we have some kind of internal time model and we're assuming we also have some kind of clock that um, can, let's say, uh, produce tick events every second while this internal clock is running. Okay, so in a way, this gives rise to three different um, pieces of of behavior. One being the um, stopwatch equivalent of the bounded counter model. Okay, so this internal passive uh, stateful model where we're keeping track of the values that we need. So here this would be the the run time and um, the lap time. And we could obtain those values from the model from this passive part of the model. Then in addition, there is this uh, clock component I just mentioned. So that can be started up and once it starts, so using presumably the start method here, then it will produce these tick events. And then I can again tell it to stop and it will stop producing these tick events. And then the third, in a way, the most interesting component that we're focusing on is of course this uh, state-based behavior that's represented by this um, state machine that we're looking at. So let's walk through this. Okay, we'll start of course, let's assume we're powering up the device or inserting the battery or whatever. Uh, it'll start with this initial state and we'll spontaneously transition to the stop state and in the process invoke the reset action to initialize everything to a sane uh, initial state. So now we're in this stopped state and presumably, well, you can imagine the um, displayed value is uh, zero, right? And now this will just stay in the stopped state until the user starts interacting with it. And one thing the user can do now is to press the reset button. So that will circle back to the stopped state and invoke the reset action. So if we're already in the, you know, if this is our initial um, stop sta stopped state, uh, it's not going to have an effect. And we can press this reset button as many times as we want and no uh, interesting visible behavior will happen at this point. Well, but there's also, more importantly, the start stop button. So if we press that, the start action gets invoked and will transition to the running state. And the, the start action starts up this clock component that sends out these ticks. So now we're in the running state. And every time we get one of these tick events, we invoke ink. So this diagram is a little sloppy in the sense that it just invokes these actions without specifying the receiver.
So the receiver of the start and stop actions is that clock component. And the receiver of ink, lap, and reset is the passive time model component. Or we could argue, well, it's not sloppy. It's just abstract. And those uh, details have not been fleshed out yet. And you might argue, well, that's reasonable, because we don't want to flesh out detail prematurely. We want to understand how the system should behave. So this is reasonable in, in that respect. Anyway, so we're in the running state. And whenever um, this tick event occurs, sent out by the clock component we started up, then we'll increment the passive time model and cycle back into the running state. And this can go on and on and on. And we're actually keeping track of time. And then if the start stop button gets pressed again, we'll transition back to the stopped state and in the process uh, invoke the stop action, which stops this ticking clock. OK. So this upper part is very easy to understand. It makes a lot of sense. So now, let's say if we did, if we did go back to the stopped state after a certain amount of time, that time is shown in the display. Um, and now if we press reset lap, now that gets reset to 0. So there is something the first time we press reset lap, but it's idempotent. You know, subsequent times, nothing new happens. OK. All right. So let's assume, though, we're in the running state and we're counting time. And now we want to say, oh, let's, uh, you know, we just passed uh, some kind of landmark and let's take the lap time. We just completed a lap, so let's take lap time so we can look at it um, without it continuing to increment. So we'll press the reset lap button in the running state. And this transitions us to the lap running state, which means that internally we still increment the uh, time model whenever we get a tick. But we also invoke this lap action on the time model, which means uh, the running time at that point will be saved as the most recent lap time. OK. And the, um, let's see. So we're then in the lap running state. And the difference is, and this is actually a little deficiency here that I think I knew about, but I haven't updated this model yet. When a tick occurs in the running state, the actions need to be increment and then update the view. Whereas when a tick occurs in the lap running state, we only want to increment internally but not update the view on each tick. OK. So anyway, let's say we're in the lap running state and we are looking at the time that was the time value when we pressed reset lap. Um, and then we're keeping time internally, but we're not updating the display. So we're seeing the time at which we pressed lap. So when we press lap or reset lap again, then we need to update the view to the current running time, and we're back in the running state. So it jumps forward to where we actually are. So it's this is how. Um, stopwatches usually work. OK, now we also have a possibility if we're in the lap running state, so we're looking at the time when the lap reset button was pressed, and internally we're further uh, ahead. And if we're now pressing stop, then there's nothing visible that happens, but um, the uh, internal uh, updating will stop because we're stopping the ticking clock. So the, um, there are no longer any increments happening internally. So for example, if we pressed reset lap at 5 and we waited 5 more seconds and then pressed start stop, 
we would have made this transition and internally we would be stopped at time 10 and we would be still looking at um, lap time 5. So if we restart then we continue keeping time internally so it would go past 10, 11, 12 and so on. But if instead we said reset from the lap stopped state then we would go into the stopped state and we would see the internal clock time of whatever it was, let's say 10. Okay. And we would be stopped, so not keeping track of time internally. So if we press, you know, if we're in the lap stopped state and we press reset lap, we, we, the time jumps forward to the current most recent time that we, we measured but we're in the stopped state. So if we press reset lap again, then it'll reset to zero because then it's tied to the reset action, you see? The update view will update it to the most current internal time and then the reset will reset that to zero. So that's how it works. You know, you can try out the actual application. Um, so maybe we should do that here and um, Let's pause here. Okay, so we got the um, stopwatch app running here. So this is what you'll wanna um, imagine this as, and you can try it out for yourself. So we're now in the stop state, then we'll press the start stop button and the um, device or app will keep time internally. So if we now hit reset lap, so we were in the running state, right? And the ticks occurred internally and you saw time incrementing and the display updating. So right now time is, is running internally. So this tick increment is still occurring. And if I go back to the running state, the time will jump forward. So let's hit that again. And it jumped forward and we can go through that again. So one, two, three, four, five, and we'll you know jump back to that. Now press that again, so we're in lap running. And now if we press, or yeah, let's say if we press, let's do it one more time and then we'll, we'll kind of keep track of it. So, so we're at 54, at 60 I'm gonna press reset lap and then we'll at 65 I'm gonna press start stop. Two, three, four, five. Okay, so now presumably we're in the lap stopped state. And how do I see the time where we stopped the, the clock or st stopped tracking internal time? Well, now we can press reset lab and then it'll update the view. So we should see about one minute and five seconds. Yep, so here we go. So now we're in the stopped state, but the running time we have measured so far is still non-zero and if we press reset lap again then this will get reset to zero. So you can you saw, saw the full cycle here well maybe you want to see this cycle here at the top so you know we can stop. And for our convenience the state names are displayed here just so we can map this more easily to the um, state machine diagram. Okay so this is the upper cycle and now uh, we can say lap and then we can do that lower cycle so we don't really see what's going on but you know we're cycling um, along this lower cycle in the state machine diagram and now uh, if we went to reset lap then because we're in lap running time will jump forward to wherever we are now right so now we have lap time at 30 um, we're in lap running now we say start stop around 35 and now if we say reset lap we'll get to the stop state we should see about 35 yep there we go and then reset again and zero okay so I hope that the behavior makes sense now now um, conceptually one key piece that I want to emphasize is the addition of this internal timer that sends out internal events in this case these ticks without the user having to um, trigger any input event. So these are autonomous internal timer events from background timers. So it's kind of a step toward um, 
autonomous um, background activities, but these are particularly simple cases of such activities because they're timer-based and they will not um, use up the processor in such a way that the the uh, device or um, or uh, machine needs to dedicate a lot of processor resources to this timer. So the timer consumes uh, or uses up negligible resources. But it's uh, very useful to have this, as we could see. And um, the next question is, how do we architect this stopwatch? Um, and you can um, look at these various aspects. OK, so we already said, well, um, based on our dynamic model on this state machine diagram, um, it seems natural to have maybe one model component that's responsible for these um, states, one that's responsible for um, the internal mm, values, sta the data values, so the running time and the lap time. And then the third one would be th for these autonomous um, timer tick events. And that separation would, would seem consistent with the um, single responsibility principle. So if you look here in, in the middle on the left, the relevant class level design principles, you know, we, we want to keep uh, the complexity of each class low, or tr you know, this includes traits. Um, so we want to keep the complexity low by, um, let's say, making sure that uh, the different responsibilities are nicely separated. And this three-way separation seems to make sense. Now, so far, this is just um, uh, conceptual behavior at the model level. But we need to expose this behavior as an Android app. OK, well, we're going to need, obviously, some kind of um, Android activity and some Android views. And the architecture at, at a high level, you can see it in our Cedar book chapter. And what we're seeing is basically, you know, like the click counter, this is what we had in the click counter. Let's shrink this a little, a little more. OK. So in the click counter, um, the view sent out events to the adapter from things like button presses. The adapter would invoke methods, hence the solid arrow, on the model. And then the adapter would talk to the view also using um, ordinary methods. But here it's a little different because um, there's more complex interaction between the model and the adapter. And um, it will look more like this, OK, in the sense that we, the user still um, triggers input events. That's the dashed arrow from the view to the adapter. The adapter still um, performs changes to the view components by, let's say, um, setting button state or uh, updating a display and so on. The adapter still talks to the model through method invocation, but now the model has this autonomous behavior. And this needs to happen whenever there is an internal clock tick the internal runtime gets updated. And in some of the states, notably in the running state, the, um, sh the time shown to the user needs to be updated accordingly. So that's why the model needs to be able to send events, push events back up to the adapter. And when the adapter receives them, the adapter will invoke a method, an appropriate method on the um, appropriate view component. OK, so this is really the main architectural, high-level architectural uh, change. The, the idea that the model is now also a source of, of events. And these are considered internal events because they come out of the model without um, being part of the same 
uh, event processing cycle necessarily triggered by a user input event. Okay. So um, the next step is, I would say, to look at the source a little bit in the context of our architectural understanding now. And um, the book chapter is, of course, based on a Java version of the countdown timer. And you can, let's say, if you look at this um, object diagram, you know, these are very similar to sequence diagrams, except they're uh, laid out a little more freely. So um, let's say the uh, okay, the user presses the start button, okay, then looking here, we transition to the running state. And at that point, the um, internal clock starts sending out these ticks. So the start tick here corresponds to uh, just starting up that clock component. And that clock component sending out a tick means it invokes the on tick method on the um, on the state machine, which is currently in the running state, so that there, there will be an object corresponding to that state whose on tick method gets invoked. And then that one will do something like an increment or a decrement on that passive time model. And these are numbered in the order they occur. Okay. So, and then there will be an update of the UI runtime. And that will get propagated upwards, see? So second step is to get the current time value, then update the time uh, by invoking this method on the adapter, and then the adapter setting the um, time value in the corresponding view component. So this corresponds to this architecture here. OK, that's the key thing. All right, so let's say the adapter starts the clock. The clock will emit a tick um, that is processed internally. And then the clock will emit a update view or update time. And that's this one. The adapter receives it and then invokes this method for setting the um, text widget, you know, the time display widget to the updated time. So that's how these two are connected. So let's take a <coughs> look first at <coughs> the uh, source code, but let's, let's look at, uh, quickly at these key architectural issues. So we're distinguishing among these three kinds of model components, dumb or passive ones, like the timer, I mean the, the time value, then the autonomous one is um, this clock that when we turn it on starts ticking. And then the reactive one is the, the dynamic behavior in the form of the state machine diagram. So this, this describes how the model reacts to, to events and how to external and internal events and how these get processed. Okay. So there is state at, at two levels, really. One is the uh, data values. And then there is this kind of uh, more abstract state in the dynamic model in the state machine. Okay. The other thing is we'll distinguish between model view adapter and model view controller. And as I mentioned last time, in model view controller, there is a direct uh, event based link from the model to the view. So this dashed arrow, there is a dashed arrow that goes directly to the view. Whereas in model view adapter, all interactions in either direction, upward or downward, go through the adapter. And you see the nice symmetry. The adapter receives events and then invokes methods. Okay, the adapter doesn't send out events. 
normally, okay? And this maps very well to Android as we're seeing in these um, consecutive examples. All right, so let's start taking a look at the source. And um, you know, th all of the Android aspects are the same as in the click counter. Um, everything starts with the Android manifest where the main activity class is specified and then we'll go into that and that's here okay so here um, there isn't this separation between the uh, abstract adapter you know, that would be room for improvement in the next iteration okay so here the um, event handling is uh, merged with the actual activity. So there's the on start stop. And it simply forwards. So this is, this is to handle start stop button presses and this is to handle lap reset button presses. The connection between the buttons and these methods is done exactly as in the click counter. You know, in the um, Android um, IntelliJ Android GUI editor. You, know, you can set those or you can set them using a text editor. You know, you don't need that GUI technically to develop. You can develop everything uh, using a text-based command line and command line-based editor such as Emacs. And or um, you don't, you know, you can you can do it by um, uh, using a remote shell connection SSH to a development machine. And that way, you don't even need a laptop. You know, you could do it um, using your Android or other device by logging in remotely. Um, but you know, it's just not as convenient. But it can be done. Okay. Anyway, so these are the two event handling methods tied to the the two corresponding buttons, and all they do is forward the um, event to the model. And I'm saying the model. Whoa, but we said there were three different model components. So how do we reconcile that? Well, we'll get to that shortly. But from the point of view of the adapter, there is just one model. And the instance variable for that is here. OK. And that model needs to be aware of this adapter instance itself. So we have to kind of inject this dependency, this is an example of dependency injection. And um, in Scala, dependency injection is often done by overriding uh, an abstract uh, instance variable. Okay, that's what we see here. Why do we, why does the model need the reference back to the um, adapter? It's precisely to make this dashed arrow possible so that it can send events to the back to the adapter. So the dashed arrow going from the model back to the adapter. OK. So now um, the other thing is, um, so we looked at the events coming from the view into the adapter. So that's the on start stop and on the on lab reset. Now we need to look at the events coming from the model into the adapter. So the, the um, dashed arrow from the model to the adapter. And these are the ones. So update time and update state. OK. Now here's an Android restriction in conjunction with the um, single thread rule for making sure that all the events are processed sequentially in the UI thread. So Swing works like this, Android works like this, most graphical UI frameworks work like this. And in update time and update state, we're receiving the events coming out of whatever thread the model controls or decides to use. So for example, one of these internal timer threads and um, that's usually not the same as the UI thread. And 
if in Android we try to touch the UI from outside of the UI thread, an exception occurs. And uh, we can see that in the log cat if we did this. So therefore, to keep um, these responsibilities also very clear, we decided that the adapter should simply accept events occurring in any thread and then the adapter is the one that knows about the UI thread and will schedule incoming events to be processed on the UI thread. So to factor out this code um, where we have to wrap whatever needs to be put on the UI thread in a runnable Okay, that's basically um, a Java thing. Um, you know, creating this anonymous instance of runnable and invoking that piece of code as the body of the run method. We can make that very convenient by creating a method for it that takes that piece of code as an argument. So this is again an example of the command pattern where we're wrapping a piece of code in a runnable so that we can invoke it um, at some later point on, uh, when, whenever we want to. And um, we're defining basically our own version of the run on UI thread method. And then because in Scala we can use, uh, if there's a single argument, we can use curly braces for that. This even looks like a control structure. So that's the way in which uh, Scala makes it easy to to extend your language and to create domain-specific languages. Anyway, so the update time will take a time argument and will set the second and minute components of the time display accordingly. And the update state is just for uh, pushing the state ID into the display or state name. So that's a similar thing, but to sum up, these actions have to be taken within the UI thread because we're touching the UI and um, Android simply wouldn't let us do this from outside of the UI thread. So even though we don't have real um, more serious uh, background activities, the timer is a kind of background activity that has its own internal thread. So it this does introduce threads other than the UI thread. And in the click counter, everything just happened in the UI thread because we did everything as part of a single step of processing each event. So here the model now has this autonomous behavior where it's producing its own events. Hence, at least one additional separate thread and the need for these events coming from the model back into the adapter to be rescheduled on the UI thread so that they are basically on the same queue as the button presses and everything else. So that everything gets processed in order. No concurrency control mechanisms are required for ensuring mutual exclusion. Because everything's on the same queue and processed sequentially, mutual exclusion is guaranteed You know when things happen sequentially. There is no overlap where you need to then bring back mutual exclusion. There's no overlap in time. Everything happens sequentially in terms of processing these events. OK, so I think the adapter and view parts are pretty clear. Now let's look at the model. Why does the adapter think there's a single model? Well, and we can sort of see this by looking at um, the name of this model implementation, and this has uh, the word facade in it. And there is the facade pattern, which you should look up. And the uh, intent of the facade pattern is to hide uh, internal complexity in, uh, in a subsystem uh, from the client. So the client is just the class that uses the other class. Here the client is the main activity, and the provider is the concrete stopwatch model facade. And internally, that will have those three subsystems, um, passive time model, um, the autonomous clock model, and the abstract dynamic behavior in the form of the state machine. 
And we're hiding this complexity, this threefold uh, complexity, these three subsystems. We're hiding their existence from the main activity. So this needs only a single re uh, reference to the model. And now we can look at the model here. And we can see, OK, there's the facade class. And then there are these three classes for the subsystems. And the facade class says, OK, well, it's my responsibility to instantiate these subsystems and connect them to each other. So internally, now we should go back here. So internally, the state machine, which represents this diagram, um, needs to be able to refer to the time model because it invokes methods on it. It needs to refer to the clock model because it also invokes the start-stop methods on it. And it needs to invoke methods like update view on the listener, which from the point of view of, of the model is the adapter. Okay, And then this other stuff is just to forward the events to the state machine. And then um, starting and stopping, which have to do with the Android lifecycle, need to get, get forwarded to the appropriate model subsystems. And then there is the support for this memento, which is for um, screen rotation, when basically uh, the, uh, the entire activity gets rebuilt, you know, it gets destroyed. But it has an opportunity to save some state, and that's the memento. That's also a design pattern from the Gang of Four patterns. The memento, which is basically an object representing just enough of the state of a more uh, interesting or complex object to be able to reinitialize a new instance of the more complex object. So that's what the restore from memento um, method does. Okay? So the memento is really just the time model, the lap time and the runtime. Okay, so let's drill further into this and we'll start with the simplest piece, which is of course the time. So there is a, a, a trait representing the abstraction and then there is the implementation and there is of course the running time and the lap time. And then the set lap time is the interesting part where it sets the current lap time to the most recent running time. The increment, of course, you know, it's very simple modular arithmetics and so on. It's all very easy. And then you can set these things also to restore them. So this is only marginally more uh, complex than the click counter. Now the clock is um, interesting because it uses this internal timer. These are um, using certain Java library classes. Um, before I forget, so there is this um, this constructor argument listener because this is where the uh, ticks go out of this clock model. So this is the listener who receives the tick events. And why is there this arrow? Well, the arrow means this is really a function that will provide, you know, that will return the listener as a result. And there's a similar thing in the um, facade, well, actually in the UI part. And it's here the fact that this listener is a lazy val. That's a similar thing. And this is because we have mutually dependent. Uh, components. See here, so there's a cycle between, um, you know, the adapter needs to have a reference on, on the model to be able to talk to the model, and there's the other direction as well. So you have to create one first. It's a chicken, uh, chicken and egg problem. You have to create one first, um, but that first one you create needs to have a reference to the second one. But the second one is still null. You know, it hasn't been created yet. So that's why you need to give the first one basically a lazy val to the second one or 
a function that returns the second one later, but you cannot return the second one before you've created it. So that's why we're using these, um, what you call call by name with the arrow or lazy val here, um, to make sure these things know about each other at the later time when they both exist. So it's a Scala thing, you know, and in Java you would have to do the same. Uh, but in Java, this would be a little less directly supported by the language. You'd have to have some kind of um, wrapper using an interface that then returns the thing, um, some kind of proxy pattern, perhaps. Um, OK, so we were looking at the model. So the clock looks like this. And we can, here's again the trait. And here is the interface or trait for the listener. And this is an example of the uh, dependency inversion principle. Anyone who wants to listen to the clock better implement this on tick listener interface, but the clock owns that interface as opposed to the, the client, meaning the one who wants to listen to the clock. OK, so it's a question of who owns the abstractions um, describing those dependencies? All right, now the default clock model has start and stop methods. When, whenever, um, and this also has a, a timer, which is a variable, and the internal data invariant is if timer is null, the clock is not running. And if the clock is running, timer needs to be non-null. And that's why we're setting it back to null here. So let's say if we invoke start, then this gets set to a new timer instance. And then um, the uh, timer gets scheduled to uh, produce a recurring event. So uh, or to run this task in a recurring way with the initial delay of delay, which is set up here to 1,000 milliseconds, and then the periodic delay being the same. So this ticks after one second, after another second, and so on, until we cancel it. OK? So the timer task is, again, a great example of the command pattern. And we need to override the run method to um, have the as the body the code that should be run when the timer fires. Okay, so here this is invoking the tick event on the listener. So in other words, we're, we're um, converting these um, periodic invocations of the timer tasks run method to invocations of the on tick event. That's our own custom event. Okay, then there's a stop method and we can invoke that and then the timer gets canceled. There's this little check so that this doesn't bomb out if the stop method is invoked in the wrong state or you know, at the wrong moment. Um, so it cancels the timer, meaning this periodic invocation of the task will stop. And it sets the timer to null so that we're consistent here. And maybe in the start method, there should be something like it should work only if the timer is null, maybe. Anyway, um, or it should assert that the timer is null. Um, anyway, so these are ideas for, for improvement. But you know, we're doing testing, so but still it's it's also good to program defensively. Anyway, so this is the clock component. And now let's look at the actual state machine. And this is maybe a little overwhelming at first, okay. But the thing is, uh, it's just uh, as close an implementation of this actual state machine, this abstract actual state machine, as possible following the state pattern. And the state pattern has these objects for the different states. okay? And each state has um, its specific behavior. And the state abstraction is here. So state just has, um, well, stopwatch UI listeners. So it needs to handle um, 
the start stop events and it needs to handle incoming kicks and it needs to have update view and get ID methods in case the update view method wants to get those from the current state. So the, the way the state pattern works is, again, it's, it's, it has certain elements of a facade also. So the state machine class, this one here, is kind of the facade around the complexity of the fact that we have multiple states. Um, but unlike the facade pattern where we have several coexisting subsystems, here there's only one state active at a time. So it's, it's a wrapper around that current state. And it receives these UI events and tick events, so from the adapter and from the clock, and just passes those on to the current state. So it forwards those. And when um, let's say we're going, we're in the running state. Um, or let, well, let's look at, at the, um, this transition from the stopped state to the running state. So initially, well, there's the reset that corresponds to the, um, to this reset action. And the init invokes that reset. So the action init gets invoked initially. So initially this says, okay, let's, transition to the stopped state and invoke the reset action. Maybe the order should be reversed to make it exactly like in the state machine. Okay. Now we're in the stopped state. So if the start stop button gets pressed, then we get in here and we invoke the, this is in the right order. So we invoke the start action over here and transition to the running state. And everything that you see in here is um, set up exactly to match the state diagram. Really the only difference is in the running state, um, let's see, the, um, there's the, let's see, no, actually it is done pretty closely to that. So in the stop state, it doesn't like tick events. So we could have ignored those or we could say, well, it's not supported here. So this gives a little bit more um, dynamic error detection. And the update view is, well, we have to show the runtime. And then if, we, if the start stop event actually occurs, we'll get into the running state. And meanwhile, we'll do the action start, which as you see here, starts the stock the clock model okay so these actions are mapped directly from the uh, state machine and the um, receivers are um, provided here in the implementation so that's why you know the state it's appropriate to have the state machine abstract without worrying about the um, presence of those other subsystems ex explicitly like the clock model and the time model so it's actually okay um, now we're in the running state, and the running state, when it gets ticks, it invokes action ink. And that means we're incrementing the runtime, and we're updating the view. And updating the view will bounce back to the state, and updating the view is defined right here again and in that's where the difference is expressed between the running state showing the current runtime and the lap running state showing the current lap time so that's why in the state machine in both cases it just says ink because the ink kind of includes the process of updating the view so that's how that works. So everything else is pretty much just uh, literally, um, con literally translating the um, state machine to the state pattern here, and 
Again, the key ingredient of the state pattern is the fact that there is a variable, an instance variable, a modifiable instance variable that refers to the current state. And whenever, you know, whenever we're doing a change, then this variable gets updated to the state that we're currently in. So again, we're in, let's say, we're starting this up. Initially, the state is null. We're now starting things up. So we go to action init. This says, let's go into the stopped state. And then let's perform the reset action. And now, let's say, if the start stop button gets pressed sometime later, then it'll say, OK, let's do the start action, which starts up the clock model. And then this performs the transition to the running state, so right here. So these, these are the transitions that exist, which are really um, differentiated only by, by destination. OK, so in other words, I can call these pretty much from any state, and then I end up in the destination state. So that's why, let's say, to running state represents any transition that takes us into the running state. All right, so you'll be able to um, look at these two things side by side and, and understand the, um, the way the abstract behavior maps to the actual state pattern-based implementation. OK, so let's leave this part here. So I think we've looked at the actual um, functional code. The next step would be to look at the test code. Well, actually, let's recap briefly here. Um, yep, so right, the interface segregation principle, I wanted to show briefly um, the fact that there are a bunch of interfaces very nicely segregated. So some of them are, are specified here. Um, there is, for example, stopwatch UI listener. And if we look in model, we'll see that these states, or even the state machine wrapper, extends these multiple interfaces. So that's an example that um, you know each of these interfaces represents a particular listener responsibility. Like the stopwatch UI listener gets the button press events, and the on tick listener gets the um, internal clock ticks. And there is a separate interface for these two separate responsibilities. And the stopwatch state machine has both of these responsibilities, so it combines these interfaces and then adds a few more things. OK. Um, back here, so, and these others um, we, we discussed. So the single responsibility principle, we can see that this gave rise to the fact that we have these multiple subsystems in the model, as opposed to having just a big monolithic model component. And the single responsibility principle is a good thing because it allows us to have the separation of concerns within the model. But then we use the facade pattern to um, hide that complexity from the adapter. So we've seen these four patterns plus memento. So I have to add that here. And um, so basically seen five new design patterns, although we saw observer, of course, and we've seen command before. So the new ones here really are uh, state, facade, and memento. OK. Now let's look a little bit at testing. And it's kind of along the lines of the uh, testing in click counter, but now there's more complexity in the model. And um, therefore, there's more complexity in the test code. So we have tests that just um, test the time model, you know, making sure that the increment and that stuff works. And um, 
that's in J unit style. And then the clock model, that's also in J unit style. Um, here, for example, we're attaching a listener. So we have our tiny, our own tiny listener, and we need this atomic integer because, again, the um, clock has its own timer thread. So to make things thread safe, um, we need to use this um, basically a variable suitable for uh, use in conjunction with concurrency with with uh, multiple threads present. So it's part of the um, concurrent uh, uh, Java util concurrent library up here is the import. So anyway, it's just like a variable that you can you can um, increment like this. So and um, what we're doing is we're setting up the model with a listener and um, what we're doing is we're attaching the listener and we're waiting five seconds plus and we're expecting the value of this uh, integer variable still to be zero because we didn't start the clock you know so the stop clock should not send anything to the listener and then by contrast the same test, but if we start the model and then wait for a little more than five seconds, then we expect the value to have gone up to uh, five. Okay, so then we, we expect to have seen five ticks. That's the idea here. So, you know, testing gets quite tricky and complicated and interesting at the same time when there are these timing issues and uh, concurrency, etc. So. That's why you see increased complexity here. Now, the more interesting one is, of course, the um, state model. And there is one that's mock-based and one that's based on kind of our own um, little fake object for the dependencies. So this is basically our own mock object that we built by hand. And it this is kind of merging. Um, everything other than the state machine that the state machine depends on into one object. So you can see that it has some elements of all of those dependencies. And now what we can do is we can basically connect everything. And that's done here. You know, look at these methods. And these are template methods. The fixture SUT is a template method. And it's defined in the concrete state model specs. You know, again, following the X unit uh, test super test case superclass pattern. And let's say this injects the dependency or connects the dependency with the state machine instance. Now, preconditions just means it's uh, in the right expected initial state. Okay, no problem. Uh, it should be in the stopped state initially. Now, when we run it, you know, basically, if we uh, start it, you know, let's say we simulate the press of the action, or we simulate the init action, and then the press of the stop, uh, start stop button, and then we simulate four ticks. We expect the time in the dependency to have gone up by four, by five, right? So if we uh, simulate the five ticks, and then we want to see the time incremented accordingly. All right. Then there are some specific scenarios, like the run lap reset scenario. You know, going once through this outer cycle. So we'll start it up. We'll we'll be initially in the stopped state. Then we'll press the start button, and now we expect to be in the running state. And we expect the timer to be ha to have been started then we expect to see or then let's say we'll we'll actually cause five time ticks to occur we do that explicitly so in other words we're testing this kind of in um uh what do you call this 
you know, when you, when you actually speed up time as opposed to slow motion. You know, so the opposite of slow motion, uh, accelerated time, like uh, just firing off these ticks without any, without giving it a break. So after firing these five ticks into the model, we expect the time to have gone up. Okay. Then we do the lap reset. It should have transitioned to the lap running. Then we do f four more ticks. Um, we should still be seeing time five because we were in lap mode. And then if we go into lap stop mode, we should still see time five. But if we then go into stop mode, that's when time should jump to the internal time. And that's where we expect to see time nine. Okay. And then when we press reset again, we expect to see time zero. Okay. So that's just going through one of these scenarios. And it's by far, it's by, by no means exhaustive, but it gives you a f an idea of what these kinds of tests would look like. And this test runs quickly, right? Unlike the um, clock model test, which ran in real time. You know, we had to wait for a little more than five seconds. So that one runs slowly. And you can see that when you try it out. Okay, now the Marquito one is similar to the other state model spec, but we're using Marquito, which you've seen in Click Counter. So we're we're uh, creating mock instances of the three dependencies, meaning the other two model components and the adapter, but viewed as just a UI update listener, meaning a component that wants to get these uh, update events and then similar thing you know scenarios um, very similar scenario here and uh, you know so we're verifying these uh, method invocation in the mock objects so you can think about the mock objects as similar to that um, that homegrown dependency um, but you know it has support for these things like keeping track of which method was invoked how many times, and so on. So you can make sure that the subject under test interacts with the dependency in the expected way. OK. And then there's one last point, which is um, you know, how do we make sure that we can test things separately so we don't want a cycle in the dependency graph? That's Uncle Bob's acyclic dependencies principle. OK. And you can see that here. So here's the dependency graph. And unless we pulled some of the interfaces out into the common package, we would have had dependencies. Because you know, obviously, architecturally, there is a cycle. But you want to break that in the code. You know, so in terms of the package level, Java or Scala or whatever language, C Sharp, whatever, dependencies, you don't want there to be cycles in this dependency graph at the package level. And often it just helps to, to pull certain interfaces out into a common package. And that's why this is, these are separate. You know, the ones that, that tie uh, the model and the adapter together. These are pulled out into common, and the interpackage cycle goes away. Okay, so these are examples of class level, of package level rather, um, design principles. Okay, so now just in in conclusion. Uh, so this is a rather loaded video with uh, a lot of learning objectives here as you as you've seen and uh, you know the preserving state under rotation you can just look at the code and it uses the momentum it's this on save um, uh, activity and on restore activity state um, but in closing so you know the this architecture is non-trivial. It's somewhat complex, but it manages the complexity quite deliberately. And you might wonder, wow, you know, did this just did I sit down and write the example like this? 
far from it. Uh, th th this is an ongoing journey. You saw that even during this video, we identified multiple um, things that can be improved. And the uh, so you're part of this journey by, by taking this class. And you should always think about software architecture as you know, not only a structure, but really a, a journey of evolving structure. And you can see, if you click on this link, the architectural journey link, you can see this long um, commit history of you know, several pages um, having its initial history in, let's say, the um, uh, a Java version. So it probably has some history in, in a swing version that's not even reflected here by these by all these commits. You know, so they're probably about a hundred commits, and um, they're always um, they're always these points where you know you're you're reviewing your structure at um, a higher level or at a more detailed level. And you're finding things where you can make further improvements. So refactoring is really um, one key ingredient here. And um, you know, it's always, and that's where the, the test suite helps you. So you, you make changes that you think improve the non-functional quality of the code. Then you rerun the tests. That's regression testing. And you make sure everything works as before. And then, of course, there are enhancements, you know, like the um, this part where now the state is shown here, that's uh, an enhancement I made not too long ago because this will um, tie the behavior that we're seeing as we're interacting with the app much more nicely to the, um, the state machine diagram. Okay, so this video has again become quite long, but I think there's really a lot of material in here that I think we we covered, again, corresponding to the um, learning outcomes stated here. So it's you know, an ambitious um, lesson, and um, I hope that you find the video helpful. So that's it. See you soon.